In their joy, they were disbelieving and still wondering. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. On September 20th, 1977, 30 million television viewers were treated to an iconic moment of television drama. It was a Happy Days episode entitled Hollywood Part 3. I think there was actually a better than even chance that I would watch it at the time. Our family being a Happy Days kind of viewing family. I was almost seven years old at the time. It's, a, it's like I'm rubbing it in on some of you over there. And in Hollywood Part 3, the Cunningham clan makes a journey from Middle America to Los Angeles, and hijinks ensue. Ultimately, while at the beach, Fonzie gets into a water skiing contest in a dare in which he proposes to jump over a shark enclosure that just happens to be right there at that beach. It's a surreal combination of the kookiest elements of sitcoms and James Bond movies all at one. And it was in a cliffhanger from Hollywood Part 2. That is, they, they ended this prior season on, you know, ooh, Fonzie's going to get on, he's putting on his skis and he's getting in the water. Then they come back next season with Part 3 and he's, you know, kind of going around and, and the tension mounts. Our one character after another exclaims, he's really going to do it. I can't believe he's really going to do it. And finally, Joni says, I can't watch. Fonzie jumps the shark. And once Fonzie did that, millions of viewers decided with Joni, not only that they couldn't watch, but they were never going to watch again. Because jumping the shark became a catchphrase for a drama that loses its narrative coherence by placing its characters in an utterly ridiculous situation that only a gimmick which breaks, which completely breaks the, wor the rules of the world in which the story is told in order to resolve the plot and move it forward. It's, be, it's entered into the popular lexicon now, when a TV show or a series <clears throat> excuse me, jumps the shark, it's just like, it's the point at which the audience says, oh, come on, right? and they, they quit watching, right? So in a sense, the, uh, the, the writers have run out of ideas, and they simply have to go start going for the ridiculous. Now, has that, let me tell you what, when Star Trek jumped the shark for me, okay? So, like, I was a Trekker as a kid, you know? I love Star Trek, you know, and the whole thing from the original. You know, I watched it in the original, right? So I am old enough to do that. So I did watch it when it was on TV at first. Until Star Trek V, the movie Star Trek V, <clears throat> excuse me, where the crew of the Enterprise with Kirk and Spock and everybody else Find, you know, they hear of this, of this being from this, uh, basically you have kind of a hippie movement starts on a planet, and it's a movement where they want to go back to Eden. So the Enterprise literally goes on a search for Eden, where they find, <laughs> it's just so, anyway, it's just, yeah, it's so ridiculous, I can't even get through this. They find a being which is basically a parody of what atheists think Christians believe God is, and then they manage to blow God up with photon torpedoes. <laughs> and it's like, you know, that, that for me, it's like, okay, this whole thing has jumped the shark. I'm done. I, I'm done. I was willing to go with Spock coming back from the dead, you know, and search for Spock. I was willing to go with that because, well, I, I, I'm a Christian, and more on that later. But, but, you know, try blowing up God with your photon torpedoes. No, I just couldn't do it. Couldn't get into the series anymore. I could multiply examples, shows like The X-Files and everything, where, again, you know, you just get into a situation where it's like, oh, I just can't follow this anymore. As far as the disciples were concerned, Jesus' crucifixion, a crucified, suffering, dying Messiah was threatening to jump the shark. It's almost like Peter takes, when Jesus, Peter takes Jesus' side and says, 
Lord, this must never happen to you. Like, this is just, I couldn't, you know, I can't go with you on this. This is just, that's just crazy talk. Right? That's utterly ridiculous. And, according to the Passion narratives, the viewership went down considerably from Gethsemane forward. Right? This is simply not how the story is supposed to go. You just don't come back from crucifixions. This simply can't happen. I just can't follow you anymore. It's ridiculous. Now, we are not too far removed from the disciples, even in our modernity, though we see Jesus jumping the shark for different reasons. You see, we moderns are embarrassed not by death, not by horrific suffering or state-sponsored torture, we find that all too easy to believe. Rather, we, as moderns, are embarrassed by the miraculous. Because we seem to think that nature, by which we mean the physical world that operates according to mathematical laws that we deduce about it, we think that nature is telling us a story that is both morally neutral, that is, our interpretation of, we think our interpretation of nature is value neutral, it's not trying, it doesn't have a political program in and of itself, and that the story that nature tells is final. When your heart stops beating, that's the end, right? End of the story, you come to the end of the book at that point. Now, nature might tell the story of God's grandeur of perfection, a well-ordered system of inputs and outputs that we are called to master and make pay. And we are so convinced of the absolutism of this storyline that we are by turns perplexed, embarrassed, or repulsed by acts of God, be they hurricanes, tsunamis, or resurrections. We just don't like anything that tends to upset the apple cart in terms of our relationship with what we see as the objective natural world. I still remember after the big tsunami in Indonesia, you know, Larry King on his program on CNN trying to grill Rick Warren about the tsunami. Like, it's his fault. It's kind of like, so tell me, why does it, you know, essentially what it boils down to is tell me why this God you believe in allows tsunamis to happen. Right? And putting Christians on the hook for things that disrupt the natural order, as if Christians are the ones that are trying to tell a story that, you know, the natural world is, you know, perfect and, you know, and that, you know, that everything is moving along as it is supposed to be. That is not actually our narrative that we are supposed to tell. We as moderns simply can't go along with violating the rules of nature. And the resurrection is perhaps the prime violation of the story that nature seems to tell us. Also, as nature worshipers in this sense, not in the sense of the pagan world in which Jesus lived, but in the world in which we think that nature or the material world is the, has the final say and is telling us a story that is objective, we also believe in the stories that the power based, that those who base their power on nature's story and what they tell us about death having the last word seems like the most natural way for all stories to end. But Easter, in this framework, with our attitudes about nature, Easter is as if God can't tell the story right. How did he let this character in the drama get in such a jam in the first place? I mean, why didn't Jesus just kind of multiply bread? Why didn't Jesus just assume power? Why didn't Jesus follow through on his threat to call down legions of angels? I'll meet your legions, Rome, and I got legions of angels. 
It's like, you know, Jesus could have told Rome that they were bringing a knife to an angel fight. I mean, you know, why didn't God do it that way? Can he not get his story right? God got his plot in such a jam that he has to use a gimmick or something that totally undermines what we think the rules of the universe are supposed to be to make it come out all right. So when Jesus goes into the upper room on the evening of his resurrection, he must, quote, open their minds to understand the scriptures. And along with opening their minds, Jesus has to open our minds too. In other words, Jesus begins to explain over the next 40 days, because sometimes that's how long it takes, that this is what the story has always been about. It's like, you know, if you come into something like, you know, now I didn't watch Game of Thrones because I'm not old enough. My mother did not give me permission to watch Game of Thrones. But it's as if, but my, from what I understand about the show, like if you came in in like season five, you have no idea. What, you know, no idea what's going on. And in a sense, Jesus has to sit down with the disciples and go through the Old Testament again to say, you guys missed seasons one through four. Or at least you didn't read them right. You weren't listening to the story. Resurrection, death to life power, the victory of love has been what the story has always been about. From the creation, to the giving of the law, to the prophets, to the Psalms, to Jesus' death on a cross, and to his new and eternal life in which he is sitting with them eating broiled fish right in the present. From Abraham to Exodus to the exile, the story has always been about the extreme, the infinite lengths to which our loving God will go to reclaim us from death and restore us to our true love and our true home with him. And in that light, in that light, as long as we're talking about narratives that jump the shark, we, we are the ones who jump the shark when we go to our own ridiculous lengths to get ourselves out of our jams to make the story come out right as far as we're concerned. That is to say, to make our stories come out without suffering being involved. To make, to tell the story of our life without death being a part of it. And human beings go through all kinds of gymnastic narrative somersaults and all kinds of behaviors to try to get out of the inevitability of telling a story that is meaningful about our lives that doesn't have suffering or death as a part of it. You can think of all the Think of all the things that you might think of as sins as human beings jumping the shark, trying to tell the story of their lives and getting themselves into such a jam that they have to do something simply ridiculous to try to cover up the fact that they've lost the thread of the narrative. We go to all kinds of extreme lengths to tell our story without trusting in God, without surrendering ourselves to the glorious new life that is God's desired destiny for us. In light of God's victory in Jesus, our sins are, can be seen as less evil than banal. One could imagine God having an eye roll. Oh, me have mercy. Right. Watching human beings do the things they do. I'd better bless their heart. Think of Peter's speech, which we read this morning. Peter says, you acted in ignorance. 
And this has been kind of the classic Christian approach to a world that needs to hear the good news that you basically were idiots. You were acting so foolishly that in a sense, this is how things turn out when you do those sorts of things. But the good news is that in Jesus, God has intervened in all of your messed up storytelling to make all of your stories come out right in the end. In light of the narrative of the risen Jesus, our lives only make sense when we trust them, when we hand them over, as Paul would say in the 8th chapter of Romans, when we yield them, when we surrender them to God's death-to-life power. This power is testified, negative to, is testified to negatively in the Psalms, basically, which cry out, God, if you don't do something really soon, <laughs> this isn't going to turn out well. If you don't do something really soon, the story is going to be something that is not in your character. That's one of the, you know, the cries of the Psalms, like, God, we know who you are, and what's happening right now is not who we know you are. So... Come on in and fix it. Come on in and fix us. Come on in and intervene on behalf of your dying people. It's testified to positively in the Acts of the Apostles, in the very miracle that is reported in, Acts, in the story that we had the back end of this time and the front end of last Sunday causing a man, a beggar, at the beautiful gate to walk and enter into the temple, into God's presence with the people of God. And people saying, who's that? That's not how blind, that's not how crippled stories are supposed to wind up, right? That's not what's supposed to happen to beggars. We know how their stories end in this natural world in which we live. What's going on here? And it's testified to in the lives of the saints, especially the martyrs, those who are most unafraid to tell a story to the world through their own lives about the victory of suffering love. God asks us to repent, to truly change, to face into suffering love, to accept the consequences of our own brokenness and then hand them over to God to be healed. And God asking us to do that may make our lives seem unbelievable or incoherent to us. Why would God ask me to do that? We can ask in our 3 a.m. moments, even when they happen in the middle of the day. Why would God do this to me? Why would God want this for me? But if, even while we are still wondering, as the disciples were in the upper room, even if we are still wondering how God's love can change our train wrecks and losses into hallelujahs, we can trust in God's power working in us more than we can ask or imagine. And our lives, instead of jumping the shark, can become a part of the greatest and most joyful story ever told. <laughs>